Today is 23 June 2009. We are at the home of Harriet Cohen in Margaretville, New York. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum in Saratoga Springs. Uh, Ma'am, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Uh, Harriet Terry Robinson Cohen. Uh, I was born in uh, New York City, November 29, 1918. And did you attend school there? Yes. In New York City, I went to uh, public school, high school, mm -hmm. and went to graduate school at Teachers College, Columbia University, where I got my master's degree. Okay. What year did you graduate from high school? I'm not sure, but I think 36. Okay, and my college was 42. I went to right. Hunter College in the city of New York. All right. Do you remember uh, where you were when you heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor? Absolutely, every detail of it. Okay. As I'm sure most people do, I was. Um, I grew up in the Bronx. My folks had a private home, and we lived there for 35 years. And uh, when I heard about it. Um, Actually, I was taking a walk going toward Fordham Road, and someone stopped me and told me about it. And then I went and took the bus to my best friend's house, and she lived some distance away, and we heard all the news over the radio. Mm -hmm. And it was a terrible shock. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> you, were, you were in college at that point. Date on uh, this, December 7th, 1941. Yes. yes. And uh, did you notice a, a, a change in your life after that moment? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm trying to remember the details of how they uh, got the draft and how people started preparing. Families were preparing for the men in the family to mm -hmm. go away. In my immediate family, there were three girls. so but we all had our all friends. The friends all came to the house and everybody was talking about it. They were familiar with it because there was a background that people that I knew knew about the Spanish War, mm -hmm. and they did feel that it would become bigger, mm -hmm. that uh, fascism was on the rise, and in some way uh, the United States would come in. We knew about what was happening in England, mm -hmm. and uh, so there was great involvement personal feelings about uh, hating fascism. Mm -hmm. What was life like at college? Did you have a lot of people or males leaving to? Well, college was an old girls school. Oh, okay. It isn't now, but at the time it was old. Okay. But everybody was talking about the war. Mm -hmm. And um, my folks wanted me to finish my education because at the time they were recruiting women to fly the planes over to Europe mm -hmm. because the, there weren't enough pilots really. Right. And I was very interested in that program, but I did stay in school. And all the, in, after I graduated from graduate school, uh, I had a degree in counseling and I got a job with the War Manpower Commission, which is now the employment office. Now, did they recruit you or did you seek them out? No, that was interesting. Columbia recruited me mm -hmm. because when I went to the employment office at college, they said, now, of course, you want to get into some thing that has to do with the war. You want to feel part of the war. You want to do your best. And I said, absolutely. And so they sent me to the war. Now, war it was the War Manpower Commission. Mm -hmm. And the job that I had was counseling young people coming in because of my degree. And people were coming in from school looking for work and not too interested in the time of getting into something that they didn't know anything about it. At the time, they were particularly recruiting for the shipbuilding, mm -hmm. which was around New York, Brooklyn, and so forth. And people were very interested, and it was our job to get them. They took us from the uh, uh, employment office, the War, Man War Manpower Commission, they took us out on field trips to show us all the different things you could do. So they were making ammunition, making shipbuilding. Um, shipbuilding was the big thing, and um, ammunition depots. 
Mm -hmm. And I remember that I went on a field trip that was like two hours away. And then as people came in to get work, it was our job to direct mm -hmm. them to that mm -hmm. completely. And, and, and we did that, the whole office. Were there enough people to, to fill the positions? Not really. No. Mm -hmm. I remember the office was at 87 Madison Avenue in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And uh, people came in from all over. Now, were you? I think there was, there was, the, the fear was that people didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. How can they go out and work on shipbuilding when there were clerks or salespeople mm -hmm. and uh, there were training programs to, to see that they would then fit in and uh, be part of building all the ships and planes and everything that had to be done. Now, did you get a lot of women applying for these yes, jobs? Yes, definitely. For many reasons. One, main one was that they needed the money mm -hmm. because the men were going away. And the second thing was that they really wanted to do something to help the war effort. And they were, you know, they were big signs, you know, buy war bonds and, uh, um, you know, it, 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 it help America. Mm -hmm. you know. Were they taking uh, job applications from minorities too at, the, at the, that yes. point? Yes. Okay. Yes, they were. All right. And um, <clears throat> what was your typical work week like? Was it a 40 hour w work week or did you work overtime too? I don't, I don't remember that part. I do remember because mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a full time job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thinking back on the salary, I think it probably was. $2,000 a year or something. Uh -huh. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Sure. What I do remember, though, is working for the War Manpower Commission, they started out immediately and said, when, you have, when you're here long enough and you have a vacation, we need you to work for the Women's Land Army and start thinking about it now. So from the day that I came in on the job, I was thinking about what I was going to do a year later when I got a vacation. And every year that I was there, up until the time that I went to the Red Cross, um, which I had to wait until I was 26 to do that, you had to be 26 mm -hmm. years old to go overseas with the Red Cross, I went with the Women's Land Army. Do you want to tell us about the Women's Land Army? Because most people have never heard of it. Well, I have the card, and I'm going to give that to you, because I, that was one of the things that I did save. Okay. I was so proud of it. Um, as professionals and trained college people, we were sent out to different locations where the crops were ready to be picked. And the first place that I went to the first summer, I went out to Long Island and we picked Brussels sprouts, and that was interesting. And then the second and third year that I went, because I think I went for three, I think I went on a double one once, and that was right up here at Tivoli where they picked apples, and they sent the uh, high school boys, not girls, mm -hmm. but it was mainly boys that I was supervising, to see that they picked the apples, and the apples were underneath the tree, and they told us what had to be done, and then somebody came and picked up the bushels. But the, they had to see that the crops didn't spoil. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, an important, and it was a, a national program. It was wonderful. And I was so proud to be part of it. What uh, type of living conditions did you have? <laughs> Odd. <laughs> we were at a farmhouse. I remember that quite well. Um, the, um, I don't remember. We were all women, of course, and we were in this big farmhouse. It was like uh, dormitory style. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember the thing that the that the farmer was very proud of was that he had a, a, a toilet that worked, not an outhouse. <laughs> and so that was the thing, but they were very nice. And we had to help in the kitchen, that we had, you know, make the meals. Mm -hmm. But they did have a local women who would come in and help with that. It was, you know, it was all volunteer, nobody was paid. Mm -hmm. It was all women's land army, you were doing it. That was a service that was available because you couldn't go and fight Hitler overseas. Mm -hmm. Did you wear any uh, sort of uniform or just your regular civilian clothes? Regular, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. And how did you get involved with the Red Cross? Well, of course, 
all of us and the whole staff was a big staff, big, you know, we had a couple of floors in a major building in Manhattan. And uh, when you went for coffee or just hanging out in the coffee time, everyone was talking about what do you, did you want to go into the Navy? Did you want to go in? And they were taking women in all of the services. And because I had two degrees, I was eligible to do that. And um, somebody came from the Red Cross and, and spoke to us. And uh, I, I thought that would be a wonderful thing to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, now it's getting toward the end of the war, going into 1945. And uh, they, uh, they signed me up right away. You had to go for a lot of physicals. And um, we were sent to Washington, to the American University, with the most fabulous training of, uh, I was not with the uh, um, Red Cross that worked in the hospitals. It was called Able Body, Red, you know, a, a Red Cross. That mm -hmm. was my title. And um, I was uh, recruited to be a club director. And I was trained to uh, be able to go and work with the Army, set up a club, man the club, and have um, programs that would entertain the men and also because they knew the end of the war was coming that it would be educational and inform all the soldiers coming through that used the club of what the benefits they would have when they were dismissed when mm -hmm. they were uh, out of the service and that was a very very <coughs> exciting program which eventually led to all these people going on to college and becoming doctors and lawyers and teachers and so forth and uh, that was all paid for by the government. But yep. it was programs that were promoted mm -hmm. by the Red Cross. So it wasn't just that I remember arriving, uh, when I went into the Red Cross, we were trained in Washington, and then I was sent to Honolulu, and then on to Saipan, and where I built two clubs that I was very proud of. The others, I worked under other people and was being trained. Okay. Now, how long was that training period? That was long because I remember being in Washington for a long time, mm -hmm. a whole winter almost, months, months, mm -hmm. probably three, four, five months. And then you went to Hawaii first? And then <laughs> I, they asked where we wanted to go, and my first choice was China, never got there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I put down wherever I was needed. Mm -hmm. And they, I think they thought because of my training as a teacher that it would be important to go where they would be uh, helping people coming out of the service and making the adjustment to civilian life and hopefully getting into the programs that they were already planning and the war wasn't even over then. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember when you, you left the States to go overseas? It was uh, approximately early in 1945. Right. I remember I was on the ship when Roosevelt died. Okay. And what, he died what was that? Bay, right? Um, uh, 45. I, I it was either April. April, because April. April, the May uh, B Day was. Right, the April, war in Europe and then ended. August was when uh, Japan, surrendered. Japan surrendered. Right, because that's the whole period that I was working with the Red Cross. Okay. What was, uh, what was that like when you heard about the death of President Roosevelt? Oh was it a shock? There wasn't so much a shock because everybody knew he was so frail mm -hmm. and, and, and really dying. Mm -hmm. When they saw pictures of him, they couldn't believe it. Even when he ran for office for the last time, and I voted for him for one time, um, he just didn't look like himself because he had been such a strong, handsome, aristocratic person. And here was this old, tired man. But there was great love, great mourning, and a lot of a lot of um, honoring of him mm -hmm. in every way, because they knew that he had been the person to help England when other people weren't, and we sent them so many of the planes and the equipment that they needed. And he figured out a way to do it, even though we weren't in the war mm -hmm. at that time. What was your trip uh, like across the Pacific Ocean? Did, oh you, did you get seasick? <laughs> no, I wasn't. I was lucky I wasn't sick. But it was an um, airplane 
that was uh, how you know there was no seats or anything. You sat on the floor. Oh, oh you, you you flew across. Uh, well, first, you took the train across the United States. Oh, I forgot that part. Okay, Think good. She, yeah, go, go I'm ahead. Thinking and, of going right from, from the beginning from Honolulu to Saipan. Okay. Now I went by plane. Um, yeah, we took the train. We went across, and that was exciting. Going with all the people that were going to work for the Red Cross, the mm -hmm. Red Cross train. And um, I remember going up the Rockies where they put an extra engine on to pull us up, and uh -huh. it was very exciting. And then we did, did get on. I hardly remember that, but um, we went to San Francisco, and from San Francisco, I'm trying to think of how we did that. I really don't remember the okay. details too much. I remember coming back, but I don't remember going too much. Okay. Except the flight from, we were in Honolulu for quite a while, also being trained by the Red Cross, mm -hmm. getting ready to go into more um, uh, not primitive conditions, but uh, difficult conditions. Okay. When you uh, got aboard ship and, and went across to Hawaii, was it a troop ship? Were there soldiers on that too, or no, just civilians? No, but coming back, I came back on the Hornet with thousands of soldiers on the boat. Okay. On the ship. And uh, you mentioned there was some more training in Hawaii. There was training everywhere with the Red Cross. You mm -hmm. always had a supervisor. You always had material to read, and you were always learning, and mm -hmm. uh, particularly about the army and and. Later in life, I was able to be a Cracker Jack organizer and doing volunteer work and mm -hmm. in anything that I worked in, and I attribute that to the training that I got from the Army. Okay. You told me, too, when you were training the women that were under you, like the questions to ask the soldiers to draw them out, some of them couldn't read and write, they would help them write letters home at the club. Didn't you have women that worked no. under you? No, no. not when I, uh, that was in Honolulu but not on Saipan, because there were um, women that were uh, sworn, the local people. Okay. Do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about life in Honolulu? What, what did they have you doing besides training? Uh, working in a club, mm -hmm. and the clubs had been there for as long as the army was there, so they were established, and to see how things were run, and to uh, be oriented to working with the service, with mm -hmm. the Army. Were there any entertainers there, the clubs? Mm -hmm. Yes, all the time. And famous people would come through, mm -hmm. and uh, and I would meet them. Who, who I remember did you meeting meet? Moss Hawk. I remember meeting Pete C. here. All, all kinds of people came in that went around the world uh -huh. to different Army spots to uh, entertain. Uh -huh. And that, even when we had the club, when we would do anything where we would get a celebrity to come, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Army helped us because our club only could handle a couple hundred people, and thousands of service people would come out for an entertainment. And Bob Hope, all kinds of people. Uh -huh. Who was your favorite entertainer of the time? Did you have one? I think I liked them all. Okay. <laughs> all right. And, and how long were you in? Uh, Hawaii or Honolulu? Not too long, a few months. All right. And then, uh, then I was assigned. They told me where I was going. They said I would be a club leader, and uh, and I had with me the uh, this um, I don't seem to find it at the moment, but okay. where everyone's listed that had the approval, of, you had to be approved by everyone. Mm -hmm. You have to have, one thing I do remember getting all kinds of shots, and, uh, and it was a long list of them before you could uh, go, up, uh, go to Saipan. And uh, you flew to Saipan? And then, yeah, that's the flight I remember. Do you know what kind of airplane it was? No. Okay. How was, the, how was the flight? Was it a long flight? was turbulent. I Very remember, turbulent? I remember. And I remember uh, one of the, there were a couple of pilots on because they changed and somebody would come back and tell us where we were and, and what was happening and why it was happening. And, mm -hmm. and uh, what was your 
impression of Saipan when you stepped off the plane? Did you notice any sort of temperature change or humidity change at all? Or? Well, I hardly remember that. Okay. But I remember being there. Mm -hmm. And um, we were on an army post, which was unusual. And the island um, had a, a population of the, the, the native people. And it was very um, kind of thing you see in uh, National Geographic for mm -hmm. me when I first came on. And then as I worked there, a lot of those people came and worked in the club, but they worked as cleaning people and gardeners and so mm -hmm. forth. And we had a very good relationship with them. What was the club like? I mean, did it have, have a thatch roof? I had two clubs. Or? Two clubs. And uh, one was uh, I. Uh, cottage type buildings uh -huh. and uh, then the one that was built that I was changed to very shortly after was a very big one I have a picture of that to show you. Okay. Yeah, if you want to just hold that up right in front of you, I can zoom right in on it. And that was when they started to emphasize counseling for people going home to use um, federal programs to their advantage. Okay. Okay. And how many people did you have working under you? Two or three. Two or three? Right. Did you find that uh, that was sufficient? No. No? I found some of my reports where that was always the complaint, we need more help. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they weren't able to send them. How many hours a day did the club operate? I think it opened early in the morning and just went on till late at night. Mm -hmm. As long as it, it was under the supervision of the Army. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were always people from the Army assigned mm -hmm. you know, to help us and be there. Were there meals served there? Uh, snacks. snacks, and of course the Red Cross was famous for the donuts and coffee. Mm -hmm. They were, oh, we used to make them in what we call great big garbage pails, uh -huh. and lots and lots of coffee. Okay. And um, do you recall anything about that experience that that really sticks out in your mind? Well, I have. I was written up in a uh, little newspaper that was put out by the service for the people that were there. You want me to read what they wrote about Oh, this? sure. Definitely. Okay. Yep. This was the Daily Target, and this is December 4th, 1945. And it said, this is from, the picture was taken by uh, Sidney Smaller from the Signal Corps. Mm -hmm. came over and took the picture, which is and it shows the service people who wanted to probably act as later in life, dressing up as women to do the entertainment. And then it says, things run pretty smoothly these days at the shanty club in the personnel center casual depot. The girls have the joint jumping every night. They can laugh when they think back to the time they were trying to get started. Wasn't so funny then the Shanty Club and the early October typhoon hit Saipan in a photo finish, and as it developed, the club's entrepreneurs took a rather bad picture, but not for long. The weather was managing to batter down just about everything in sight, except the Red Cross gal's spirits. In the middle of the private indoor lake stood piles of their supplies, construction materials, plumbing, wiring, tarps, etc. But instead of wringing their hands, they wrung some more water out of their clothes and set to work. They coaxed GI cans of coffee from the mess hall, set up a snack bar on packing cases, lit candles, and the party was on. Things went like that for three nights and two days until the storm blew itself out. After su surviving such a brutal birth, it's hardly any wonder the shanty flourished. The club is virtually always a packed place and becoming, and the girls, uh, that's a little, uh, I'll skip that. 
they report a 12-piece colored band of versatile musicians and entertainers called the Metro Domes, they scored, which scored a smash hit, and so did the Grand Canyon Boys. They loved these big shows where they came in and were entertained. Uh -huh. So it was really two things. They came in to play cards and do jigsaw puzzles and, and talk and visit and eat, but they loved the big entertainment. The ARC, ARC girls who have made the shanty what it is today, Terry Robinson, club director, Pauline Dempler, George Miller, Laura Biddle, and Teresa Casper. Very nice. Now, how long were you on site, Pam? Um, through uh, 45, the, uh, to the end, because then the war was over in mm -hmm. Europe, then the war was over, and, and we were there when the planes were going from Tinian, and we knew about that. Right. Right after it happened, immediately, because it was a big, you know, we mm -hmm. dropped the bombs in Japan. But as soon as they did, we had people coming in from the army and telling us what was happening. Now you were on Saipan when, I was on Saipan when Japan <laughs> surrendered. And the planes were going from Tinian, which was right there. Mm -hmm. And then um, this club, which was being built, and really they rushed to get it done because then the war was over and they started to process people to go home. Mm -hmm. And the processing, I don't have to tell you, the army did its best but there were thousands and thousands and thousands of men waiting to go home and anxious to go home. And it was based on the amount of time that they had been away. Yes. And they hung out in the club and we needed more and more programs. But not only do, did we emphasize the programs to keep, hopefully keep them entertained, which was very difficult because they wanted to get home as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. But the things that they were interested in were the, the um, educational opportunities when they got back to the States. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting is they started a Mariana, the, the uh, Mariana Islands mm -hmm. University. Oh. And so that people, they had started to get teachers to come in so that they could get credit when they got home. And uh, I also have found in my old records that they gave courses in all kinds of things from physics to political science to whatever. They could get a group together and get a teacher mm -hmm. right away that they gave it um, university status and credit. And so that they were able to go home with documents saying that they put so much time into it and what the curriculum was that they covered. It was very impressive. Yes. Let me go back just a little bit. What was it like when you, you heard about the atomic bombs being dropped? Oh Did you have any idea the no, devastation? it was shocking, shocking. Mm -hmm. It was shocking. And what about once Japan surrendered? Was there a lot of celebration on the island? Not really, no. It was just, it was, it was all talk about when, when the soldiers could go home. Mm -hmm. It was immediately switched to in the people that I was with was what, could we do to help them make the adjustment to going home? But in our case, also knowing about all these programs that they were going to get for free. Mm -hmm. Were you ever in any kind of danger on Saipan at all? Were there Well, you felt that you or? were because the um, it was very strict mm -hmm. that when you went anywhere, you had to go. We went in a jeep, and uh, there always had to be two army people with you with weapons because there were still Japanese hiding out on the mm -hmm. islands. Not many, later transpired there weren't that many, but they took precautions. And so you always knew, you know, but the danger of an attack or anything like that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Did you or any of the people you were with uh, suffer any problems from tropical diseases like malaria or dengue fever? Or Anything no, like that? No, just we all got fungus infections and ended up <laughs> occasionally in the hospital where they were treated. Uh -huh. My mother hates mildew. <laughs> <laughs> um, what were your living quarters like on Saipan? I have pictures of that. There's a, there's a latrine out in the back uh -huh. and uh, tents. 
Oh, and, you lived in tents. And, well, part of it was in a tent. I remember there were also um, like shacks, um, and the big thing was finding a fan, electric fan. We had electricity. Uh -huh. We set that up, and uh, I oh, I just remember being quite comfortable. What about um, like land crabs or? Insects or don't snakes remember, or no, don't remember that nothing at all. like that. No. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting you're bringing up the physical aspect. Um, we always try to cover our hair because when you went around, especially in a jeep, and you were going anywhere, and of course we had to cover a lot of territory, getting from one building to another or one section to another, working with the army, that the coral dust would blow in the air, and so that your hair would be, feel like uh, cement. Oh. <laughs> so you were always washing it. <laughs> and we didn't know about suntan then, so we got very, very brown. Uh -huh. And uh, what about your, your dining facility or mess hall? Did you eat with the service people? or? I so, so don't remember that too well. Mm -hmm. um, we had the officer's status. I remember when we were in Honolulu, we ate with the officers, and that was quite grand. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I have a, a menu here I'm going to show you because that's interesting. Mm -hmm. This is the officers, officers club. In Honolulu. Okay. And this is what's interesting. Schofield Barracks Officers Club dinner, Sunday, April 22nd, 1945. Shrimp cocktail, 25 cents. <laughs> so, and all the prices are juice, 10 cents, hotel cut Delmonico steak. One dollar. You'll never see prices like that again. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me just see if I can zoom in on that. Okay. But also remember that the salary was seventy five dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So, for the Red Cross, and I, I had a, um, I think I had a major. So I, I got a card that if I was captured, that I would have the standing of a major. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what majors were getting at the time. Now, back then, was seventy-five dollars a month pretty good pay? Oh yeah, that's professional. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> to me, <laughs> I was happy to have it. Uh huh. All right, and I think you touched on this. Uh, before, but how do you think your, your time in the Red Cross changed or affected your life? Um, a great deal. First of all, living with a group, working close to the Army, I did feel as time went on that if I had to do it over, I would have gone into probably the Navy, mm -hmm. the Air Corps, the Army, not the Red Cross, because I was in uniform and I loved being in uniform. I was part of doing something. I was part of a group that was important, but it wasn't the service. Mm -hmm. Have you stayed in contact with any of the people you had served with? I did with? for many years, and it's one of my regrets that I didn't keep at it. Mm -hmm. Do you um, still maintain contact with the Red Cross? Are you involved with them today no. at all? Or? No. Okay. They did, after I came home, um, they did write to me and ask if I would go to Japan and set up clubs there, mm -hmm. but I didn't. And what happened when you came back to the States? That was interesting. Uh, I came back and decided not to go back to the War Band Power Commission mm -hmm. and to um, get a job with a trade union, which was working with trying to um, better conditions in state-run mental hospitals. And that was very interesting work. Mm -hmm. 
And I understand your your late husband was a veteran. He was a veteran, yes, and uh, he was a war hero, and uh, he did a lot of volunteer. He also worked for a trade union. That mm -hmm. was how I met him. Okay, I was going to ask you that. And we met in Albany at a demonstration to get um, benefits for veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, how many years did you have together? Oh my, 60 almost. I was married in 1947 mm -hmm. and he died in 06. Okay. And children and grandchildren? I have two wonderful children. I have four grandchildren and now I have two and almost three great-grandchildren. And they're all, I can be proud of all of them, they're wonderful. You know, I'd like to ask you a question, too. At the beginning of the war, you didn't mention it, but do you think being Jewish had any impact of your experience during the war, and the knowledge you had of it when it was starting? Or, or no, that was interesting, because when I applied, when I was going, that is an interesting, this is Debbie, my daughter, that's here, um, and I told my friends, that I worked with, that I was going to apply to what I finally did, they said, they'll never take you because you're Jewish. Really? And every place I went, I was, and I feel that was because I had a degree, mm -hmm. and it had nothing to do with religion. Um, what was interesting, also being Jewish, when I was on Saipan, my brother-in-law was a rabbi, and he was assigned to, um, and I have pictures of that, um, uh, as a, um, the rabbis that were the chaplains. chaplains, and he was a chaplain on Saipan, and uh, he would have me come over and do some of the prayers when they would have services, and they gave him all the benefits of anything that he wanted. He was a wonderful chaplain, mm -hmm. had beautiful services, and uh, a lot of people came, and Jewish and not Jewish, mm -hmm. because a lot of people wanted to see what the services were, particularly at holiday times. Sure. So. Uh, I've heard that from a number of veterans. It didn't matter the religion. Right. If there was a chaplain there, everybody went. Yes. Yes. Okay. Was there uh, anything else you can think of? Well, I was wondering, at the beginning of the war, if a Jewish <clears throat> family had more information about what was really happening in Europe with the Jews than the, pop the general population. To my knowledge, because I worked in a big office, Everybody knew what was happening because it came down in a variety of ways. And it seemed to me that some of the information I got was through Eleanor Roosevelt, who lived in Greenwich Village, or had, you know, of course she had Hyde Park, and mm -hmm. she lived in the White House and so forth. But there were groups of women who were talking about what was happening with Hitler. And uh, I knew all about that before I went overseas. I mm -hmm. knew about that early on. Maybe because I was living in New York. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, well, thank you so much for your interview. Thank you very much. Okay, now you have your ID card from the Women's Land Army? Yes. Okay, let me just zoom in on this that. Is 1944. Okay. All right, got it. Okay, thank you again. <laughs> thank you.